So let's talk about Memories of Phantasm. For a lot of people, this show's production was a dream come true. Toho Genso Manga Kyo, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that the weebs of YouTube were watching. <clears throat> there, I said it correctly. Isn't this what you wanted? Anyway, this show, which I will henceforth call Memories of Phantasm, was to be a cutesy and fun indie anime adaptation of the Toho series. Remember those quotation marks, they're going to be very important later. It was created by Manpuku Jinsha, a doujin circle of nearly 100 artists, including many professional animators. Memories of Phantasm would perfectly scratch that itch that so many fans of Toho had been failing to reach for over a decade. But in spite of that, the show is kind of unpopular. A lot of the story is boring, and while the animation is solid in the beginning, it really sharply declines as the series continues. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, you might know that I'm a pretty big fan of the lore of the Toho project, and that I think that it can be pretty important to consider when creating a derivative work. But if you've clicked on this video in a righteous rage, expecting to see me destroy this series for its poor characterizations, lore inaccuracies, and poor taste fan service, well, you're gonna be really disappointed. You see, it isn't as simple as calling this show good or bad. Memories of Phantasm is a complex mess of successes and failures that's really hard to sum up in just... Oh. Oh my god. So I think that while there's a lot to learn from what Memories of Phantasm did wrong, I think there's also a lot we can learn from what it did right. So let's take a look at what the series is, what it wanted to be, and most importantly, what we can learn from it. Now, before we can analyze the silly Toho anime, we need to talk about authorial intention. Authorial intention is... Okay, maybe we can't get too deep into this topic, but let's get a brief idea of what it is. The Oxford Dictionary of Media and Communication defines authorial intention as a position that argues that the creator of a text possesses a privileged understanding of its meaning and that, consequently, any interpretation that contradicts this understanding must defer to the author's intentions. Authorial intention can be thought of as one school of thought on a spectrum of artistic philosophies ranging from extreme intentionalism, which holds the author's mindset supreme even when unintentional, all the way to new criticism, which is... bad. Alright, to be fair, if you want to know more about new criticism, you should read Death of the Author. It's a well-written essay, but we're here to talk about why authorial intention is important to the discussion of memories of phantasm, and really, media criticism in general. But to show you why authorial intention is important, I have to go somewhere. I have to go... to the world's biggest cocks. See what I did there? I am at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, Missouri, and this giant white feathery thing behind me is one of Klaus Oldenbury's four shuttlecocks. It's a series of enormous sculptures commissioned by the museum itself. It was created by Klaus Oldenbury and his wife Kosi van Bruggen in 1991. The museum had the idea of commissioning a large-scale art piece that incorporated both the landscape of the lawn and the architecture of the museum itself. So in 1991, they flew Kosi van Bruggen and Klaus Oldenbury out to Kansas City in search of inspiration. The first thing that Kosi van Bruggen took note of was the many Native American art pieces featured at the museum. She took note of the great feathery white headdresses, and that gave her the idea of scattering large white feathers around the museum. While ultimately this idea didn't make it past the drawing board, it did give Klaus Oldenbury another idea. He noted that from an aerial view, the landscape of the lawn with the building in the center looked like a giant tennis court, and that gave him the idea of the shuttlecocks. Each of these four shuttlecocks is very technically impressive. Each one measures over 6 meters high and weighs over 2,500 kilograms. But despite the scale of the project and the depth of its inspiration, when they were debuted, the shuttlecocks were harshly controversial. The leading newspaper, the local Kansas City Star, published several comics mocking it and even protested its installment on the Kansas City lawn. Because it was so divisive when it was debuted, many considered it to be a failure. But in the eyes of the donors and the eyes of the artists, it was an absolute success. It did everything that the museum wanted it to do. And I think that's why it's so important for us to consider the intentions of an artist when criticizing their works. Criticism shouldn't just be about complaining about everything you don't like about an art piece. It should be about discovering what an artist wanted to do and seeing how well they did it. And I hope that that's going to be my intentions when going forward with Memories of Phantasm. Now, we could attempt to discern the authorial intention of Memories of Phantasm by viewing it from beginning to end. But without any context, there could be some different interpretations of its artistic direction. So before we look at any of the series itself, we have to look at some of the promotional materials surrounding its release. The first piece of promotional material released was the animated opening sequence of the first episode, which was released as a teaser in September of 2010 at the Autumn Reitaisai. If you don't know what Reitaisai is, it's essentially a massive Toho convention held in Japan twice a year. It was here that they sold the DVD copies of the series intro theme. This would eventually end up being a recurring marketing tactic for Monpuku. Whenever an intro theme was finished, it was released on DVD along with some of the behind-the-scenes footage of its creation. 
It's a really neat way to build up hype for the show while still making some extra revenue on the side. I love it. So in 2010, the opening was released, an animated sequence featuring tidbits of the show playing along to an original opening theme by the Dojin Circle Yuhei Satellite. This intro goes fucking hard! It's a remix of the Gensokyo the Gods Loved with a fantastic display of colors and movements. The animation is spectacular, the coloring is beautiful, the music is stunning. Everything about this opening is just amazing. There's so much life and energy here that it's hard to not get excited for it. After the opening was released, and leading up to the release of the first episode, the two primary press outlets for Manpuku Jinja were their Twitter account and their official blog. These two sites were both operated by the show's lead writer, Tommy Chin. Remember this too, it will also be very important later. According to a series of tweets by Tommy, the first episode of Memories of Phantasm started production shortly after the release of the opening. It seems that when the show was in production, Tommy was the lead writer, but he was also working with another writer that I wasn't able to find. Apparently, the script that this mystery writer made was so bad that Tommy decided to write the entire thing himself, so he wrote a new screenplay for the first episode in... THREE DAYS?! What the hell, I can't write a script for a 6 minute video in 3 days, let alone an entire screenplay. But nonetheless, the script was written, and the episode's production began. This is where we begin to see some of the early symptoms of the issues that would plague Memories of Phantasm production for the rest of its lifespan. From pretty early on, it seems that the direction for Memories of Phantasm was pretty unclear. In fact, there are multiple tweets from Tommy stating that his ideas for the show were often undercut by the director, while Robbie... Nu... Nukeraku? Nuke... Nu... Fuck it, I'm just gonna call him the director. It seems that the story written by Tommy followed an action-focused shounen anime style, while the director added in elements of Yuri and romance during the storyboarding phase. If you don't know what Yuri is, I'm gonna be very vague and say that it's girl-on-girl -girl romance. I don't need to make my comment section more inflammable than it already is. Wait, is it flammable or inflammable? What the fuck? They mean the same thing. Anyways, Tommy himself admits that he has no experience in writing Yuri or romance in general, so he sticks to referencing shonen anime. For better and for worse, this is very obvious. Memories of Phantasm has a lot of references to popular shonen anime and the tropes associated with the genre. For example, each episode of the first major arc, The Scarlet Mist Incident, starts with a recap of the previous episode, the way that a lot of popular shonen anime do. During this first arc, the prologue theme that plays is actually a remix of the opening theme for that arc, but it's composed in the style of Dragon Ball Z's prologue theme. It even carries into the second major arc of the series, the Imperishable Night arc. No, I'm not counting the 60 Years Instant arc, we'll get to the reasons why later. In this second arc, the prologue theme is also a remix of its respective opening theme, but this time it's composed in the style of Dragon Ball Z's second prologue theme, the one from the Boo arc. This is a really great tribute, as it evokes nostalgia and pays homage to one of the titans of the genre, while still making an experience that is completely unique to Toho and especially to Memories of Phantasm. Unfortunately, this is one of the very few good taste references to other media that you'll see in this entire series, so don't get used to it! We've established that Memories of Phantasm was written by Tommy to be a pretty generic and enjoyable shonen anime, with some fan service written in by the director in later production. But what about its relationship with the source material? Well, this is where those air quotes that I used earlier come in. You see, a lot of people see Memories of Phantasm as an attempt to animate the original game series it was based on, and for that reason, it is harshly criticized for being inaccurate to the lore of Gensokyo and the characterization of its inhabitants. But here's the problem with that criticism. That's not the fucking point of Memories of Phantasm! It was never the point! We actually know that this isn't the point because Tommy says that it wasn't. In this Twitter thread, he says that the purpose of Memories of Phantasm is neither to faithfully adapt the source material, nor to improve upon it, but rather to be a sum of the most common fan interpretations of the series. This is why the characters seem to be more flat and flanderized than their canon depictions. Memories of Phantasm isn't an adaptation of the Toho Project, it's an adaptation of the fanon of the Toho Project. So it's in really poor taste to criticize Memories of Phantasm for being inaccurate to canon, when it's a derivative work with its own identity. I mean, for fuck's sake, half of the Toho wiki page for Memories of Phantasm is taken up by the deviations from lore section, 
but yet the cast section hasn't been updated past the first episode, and the music and trivia sections haven't been touched in years. No other fan work on the wiki has this section. Why is it necessary for Memories of Phantasm? I just don't understand why people get so stuck on this point. So for the rest of this review, we're going to be looking at how well the plot of Memories of Phantasm stands on its own, not how well it stands as an adaptation of the Toho Project. Well, we've been beating around the bush for over 10 minutes now, so it's time we pop the sucker in and see how it holds up. The first episode opens with an establishing shot of the Saigyo Ayakashi, which, as we will see, won't be very important to the story, but it does let us know where we are. Even if you don't know what the Netherworld is, you can kind of get the gist with this shot. We also see Yomu and Yuyuko here. While we can't tell exactly what they are trying to do from their dialogue alone, it's pretty clear that they're up to something nefarious from the tone and the scene in their expressions. And roll the intro. I've already sucked this intro's dick enough, so I think we can just skip through this one. Now we're at the Hakurei Shrine. Marissa pokes into Reimu's room to tell her that she's found an ice fairy, but Reimu doesn't seem that impressed. This makes Marissa immediately angry and she starts yelling about the strange weather, saying that this has to be the fault of some yokai. She starts pointing at Reimu and telling her that it's the Shrine Maiden's responsibility to resolve incidents before taking off to fix it on her own. Now allow me to point out that it has been 1 minute and 40 seconds, and we already know our main antagonist, our two protagonists, the dynamic between the two, what incidents are, what the plot of the episode is, what Shrine Maidens are, and why Marissa is so frustrated with Reimu. These are essential plot beats to set up in the first episode, and Memories of Phantasm waste no time in showing them to us. In a mini-series like this, it's really important to set these things up very early on. Compare this to Over the Garden Wall, which only has a runtime of 110 minutes, and it still takes over 2 minutes to introduce this plot important information to us. I'm not saying that every show should race to dump as much info on you as possible as soon as you start, but in a series with limited runtime like Over the Garden Wall and Memories of Phantasm, it is really important to save time by not beating around the bush. And what's better is that all of this information is presented to us all through natural and fun dialogue, so that we get to see the characters instead of just being told about them. The next scene opens with Marissa running into Letty White Rock, who is surrounded by an array of bullets. Something that you'll notice right away is that the bullet animation in Memories of Phantasm is beautiful. The use of shape, color, and movement really does a good justice to how beautiful the bullet patterns in the Toho franchise are. A quick cut to Rei Moon, we're back at the end of their implied battle. Now, implying a minor fight like this is fine if you want to preserve runtime and save on the animation budget for more important scenes. Oh, why the fuck is she here? Okay, so this is a problem that we're going to see throughout the rest of the series. A lot of characters appear in episodes that they don't really need to be in. They take up screen time without really contributing anything to the story other than being fan service for fans of that character. Ai is a character that specifically shows up frequently in stories that she has no relevance to, and this episode is no exception. In fact, the only thing that she does in this entire episode is show up so that they can use the snapshot effect to save on animation frames in the following scenes. And while this isn't the worst way to do it, simple cuts would have also been fine. Especially in this scene with Chen, where the cuts don't actually hide any animation skips. They're just obnoxious. But ignoring the cuts, this scene is actually really fun. I love the weird geometry of the set, it lends itself to a Scooby-Doo-esque chase scene. The sheer creativity really stands out from the rest of the other shots in the series. But again, it would be nice to know why Marissa's chasing this cat around. Is it her cat? Is it her friend? Did the cat steal something from her? Did the cat promise her some information if she caught her? Even in the context of the plot of the original game, this scene doesn't really make that much sense. And again, this scene is really great, but it could have done with a tad bit of writing and without the shutter cuts. The following three shots involve Marissa approaching the house of Alice Margatroyd, which again isn't really explained. It's a decent scene, but without any context, it's kind of just fan service. The following shot at least makes a bit more sense. If Marissa's looking for information on who caused the incident, a library would probably be a pretty good place to go, especially an obviously magical library. But after this flash montage, Marissa finds a trail of light reaching up to the sky, the same trail that we saw in the first establishing shot. This rotating shot here is amazing, it really emphasizes the size of the staircase leading to the netherworld. The tone shift also really sets up our expectations for what's about to go down. We get a dialogue exchange between Marissa and Yomu, which does a great job of characterizing the both of them. I especially love the part where Marissa says, It's okay if you resist, I love using force. It's such a neat way to show off the playful brute that she is in the show. Yomu, of course, says the classic, Ah, I wouldn't have expected a mere human to get this far. So we can clearly see that yokai and even half yokai consider humans to be inferior in this world. And don't you worry, you won't have to remember this. It's going to be reiterated about 20 more times before the series is over. Following is the first fight scene of the show. It's great! The two run around throwing out blasts of magic at each other. Yomu uses her swords to deflect Marissa's bullets, which is a really cool detail that also explains why she even carries a sword if she can shoot magic bullets. The fight choreography is really cool. They interact with the environment, they keep the shots moving, and the fight is ended by Marissa using her Master Spark to propel herself out of the dust and charge into Yomu. 
After being shown into the wall, Yomu gives the classic, ah, I underestimated you speech, before the real antagonist of the episode appears. We get a little pause screen here, which is a bit like the splash screens used in TV anime, to smoothly transition to and from a commercial break. It's a cute touch, and it actually serves a double role here. You see, originally this episode was planned to be released in two parts, and this is where the first episode would have ended. But Monpuku thought that the episode would feel more complete with both parts, so they continued production until both could be released on a single disc. Remember this, as it's a good decision that they will never make again. So the implied commercial break ends, and we're back to the Hakare Shrine. Reimu's still doing her thing, and by her thing I mean literally nothing. Sakio shows up to deliver a message. She gets a quick introduction by the way of Reimu calling her the vampire's maid and asking where her mistress is. This is really interesting, as it intrigues us with information of characters that we haven't met yet, and will be important later. Sakia tells her to go do the plot, to which Reimu responds that she's the protagonist and the plot will happen whenever she wants it to. This scene is very simple, but it tells us a lot about who Reimu is and the burden that she carries as a shrine maiden. After this, we're back in the netherworld, and Marissa's talking big smack before she promptly eats shit. And we see Yuyuko again. Here she reveals her master plan to put flowers on the big tree, I guess. I don't know. Do you know? I'll fucking know. Marissa becomes mesmerized by an absolutely beautiful display of Donmaku here. I've said it before, but I'll say it again, the Donmaku animation in this show is stunning in the most literal sense. Right before she's blasted by a massive beam, she gets yanked out of the way by Reimu. The show's opening theme kicks in and the vocals get to their climax right as Yuko sends out a massive array of bullets. Marissa hangs 10 on her broom and sends out her most powerful attack, the Master Spark, but Yuko dodges it easily. Just when it seems that she has the upper hand, she's caught dead in her tracks by a barrier. Reimu performs her powerful and iconic fantasy seal and the fight is over. This is one of the best villain fight scenes in the series. Both sides get to show off their cool abilities, and ultimately, Yuko is foiled in a way that makes sense. She underestimates humans, toying with Marissa and making fun of her weakness. She laughs throughout the entire fight to demonstrate her pride, and it is in this pride that she stops to make fun of Marissa and is caught in Reimu's barrier. It's a really natural foil that makes sense for her character and feels deserved by the protagonists. Then, after the world's crunchiest explosion sound effect, we're back in Gensokyo. Spring has returned, and the protagonists are having a big party here with many other characters. I've mentioned before that the show has an issue with bringing in characters that aren't necessary to the plot, but in this scene it isn't much of a problem. The background characters are more like extras, they have very little animation budget given to them, they aren't really called out by the story, and they serve as secondary action to accentuate the dialogue of the protagonists. So here I think it works really well, as it improves the story instead of stopping the story to focus on unimportant characters. We also get a bit more development on Reimu and Marissa. Reimu admits that getting her hands messy with yokai makes her shrine less popular and causes more work for her, which makes her a bit more understandable as a character. It's not as though she doesn't care about Gensokyo or the incidents, she just doesn't want to put in extra effort. But as we see, she's willing to do it if it involves Marissa or her close friends getting hurt. Their playful banter here is really cute, and I think it shows how good of friends they are. What the fuck? Shipping police, get on your hands and knees! Oh jeez, take me out to dinner first. The episode closes with a cute little argument and some forced girly fan service, and the credits roll. This first episode is really good. To be honest, all the issues I had with it were really minor. This episode still has some of my favorite shots, and even though it was written in three days, the plot holds up. It's simple and it makes sense. There are a few cameos that didn't need to be there, but I don't think they detracted too much from the overall experience. The animation was fluid and stunning, and the episode as a whole felt like a cohesive and polished artwork. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is the best we're ever going to see in this series. There is only one other episode in the rest of Memories of Phantasm that even comes close to being as good as episode 1. But other than that one episode, all of the minor nitpicks I had with the show are going to become more and more of an issue until they are causing it to no longer be fun to watch. But let's continue on so that I can show you what I mean instead of just telling you. And yet again, the next promotional material released by Monpuka Jinja after the first episode would be the opening sequence of the next episode. I'm not really sure why, but Monpuku decided to make a pretty heavy investment by creating a new opening sequence for the second episode, which would also be the opening theme for the show's first major arc, the Scarlet Devil Saga. Just like the first opening, it's great! It has vibrant colors, fluid motions, and okay, holy shit, let's talk about all of this. So many of the most common criticisms that Memories of Phantasm receives are related to the show's sexual fan service. This can range from criticism that the show has too much fan service, to the show having poor taste fan service, and even to having any fan service at all. The last is the most extreme example, which I personally think is just bogus. 
It's rare to see anyone complaining about Dojin comics having fan service or even outright pornography, because that's expected of fan works. Since they are derivative, they are based on the artist's personal conceptions of Toho and Gensokyo. But the same expectations apparently don't apply to Memories of Phantasm for unknown reasons. To say that it doesn't represent the series is a bad criticism, because Memories of Phantasm was never intended to represent the original series. As we talked about earlier, the purpose of this show was not intended to be an anime adaptation of the Toho project, but rather it is to be an anime adaptation of the fan interpretations of the series. This is how Memories of Phantasm was advertised from the very beginning. Leading up to the release of the first episode, Tommy wrote this blog post to talk about the show's production. It's a somewhat funny article as Tommy announces that the first episode's production has been completed, and he role plays as Alice to respond to some of the more common questions from fans. This article says the word boobs five times. It's very clear that fan service is very important to the most of the staff members at Monpuku. Boobs are a favorite talking point of both Tommy and Luna Moon, and Yuri's a favorite topic of the director. So would it even be fair to say that Memories of Phantasm should have less fan service? I don't think so. If the core creators of a Dojin work all love sexual content and agree to include it in their works, why is that from an artistic perspective a bad thing? It accomplishes the goals of the creators, brings artistic fulfillment, and for a lot of audience members, it makes for a very pleasant viewing experience. Remember, Memories of Phantasm isn't a corporate shill to sell merchandise. It's an indie project made by a handful of passionate creators. So while I myself don't care for some of the sexual content, I think it's both unfair and uninformed to say that it makes the show worse. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it's bad. I'll leave this point on a quote from Roger Ebert. Are vampires kinky? I don't know. Wait, no, that's the wrong quote. There are two things you can't argue in film, comedy and eroticism. If something doesn't make you laugh, no one can tell you why it's funny, and it's difficult to reason someone out of an erection. But oh, don't you worry, denizens of the internet, this isn't the last we'll talk about boobs in this video. Megafrog will return in a moment. Hey, I just want to real quick say that this video is sponsored by me, motherfucker, on my brand new Kofi page. Making these videos is really expensive, but lucky for me, I can write these motherfuckers off on my taxes. But if you want to help out the channel, I do have a Kofi page where you can commission me to do voice acting. You can pay me to read a funny tweet or read over a meme or something along those lines. I've been overwhelmed with the amount of support I've gotten from this channel so far, so really, thank you so much. In every little bit means so much, so thank you for watching and back to the video now. And now, back to Megafrog. Episode 2 opens at the Moria Shrine, which might seem like a bizarre choice. Like, following the plot of the Toho series, we're still quite a ways out from the plot of Toho 10, so why is this scene here? Well, it's for the exact same reason that Sané shows up completely unprompted in the post credit scene of the first episode. Luna Moon, the character designer for Memories of Phantasm, wasn't sure which characters would be needed for the first episodes of the series, so they made reference sheets for several characters. Sané was actually one of the first characters ever designed, so Tommy as the writer felt that it was necessary to include her in the early episodes. While I would disagree that her appearance in the first episode was well placed, I do actually think that using the Moria Shrine as a setting to introduce the plot of the upcoming episode is a fantastic and really creative idea. It allowed the animators to make use of the reference sheets that they had already designed. Marissa gets up on stage and begins telling Arakugo to retell the events of the Scarlet Devil incident. From here, most of the issues of the episode are pretty similar to minor issues I had with the previous episode, but here they are much more noticeable. The decision was made to split this episode into three parts, which is a bit more understandable considering that this arc has a total of 38 minutes of original animation, discounting, of course, recaps and the opening sequence. That divides into three episodes of about 13 minutes of animation space. So I don't think that this splitting decision was a bad idea, but it does mark the beginning of a trend of shortening episodes. Now you might have noticed that all the scenes I've shown so far in this episode have a distinct lack of voice acting. And that is because, dear viewer, Memories of Phantasm has no voice acting. You see, the lead creators knew that they would not have enough budget to hire voice actors to dub the series, so they simply animated it based on scratch audio, added music and foley, slapped on Japanese subtitles, and shipped the product. I'm not kidding, this is actually how they made it. Any voice acting you've heard in this series is actually a fan dub made by Japanese fans. That being said, when the first episode was re-released on Blu-ray in 2018, it actually came with official Japanese voice acting, making it the only episode to have any vocals outside of the intro theme. Well, 
お詫びのしるしにね趣向もお持ちしましたのでお Lucky for you, I illegally downloaded this episode to prove my point. Dog, I think I downloaded the wrong movie. And that is why you always purchase a product before reviewing it, kids. So, for the rest of this review, I'll be looking at the official master, not the fan dubs, because it would be completely unfair to criticize a product based on unofficial modifications made to it after its release. So, the plot of the Scarlet Devil saga is pretty much as follows. Marissa is out finding fairies when Aya appears and spends nearly a full minute explaining to her why this mansion that just appeared is super cool and mysterious, and probably has some neat treasure she should check out. Again, why is Aya here? She isn't really relevant to the grand plot of the arc, and using her as the inciting incident for the episode doesn't make much sense either. If we've written Marissa so far to be a proactive, adventurous, and even reckless character, why would she even need an outside voice to go tell her to go inside the mansion? It's literally right there in front of her. We even see from the dialogue that Marissa knew about this mansion because she read Aya's newspaper. At this point, I'm ranting a bit, but the point is that it would feel more fulfilling for the audience to watch the protagonist engage with a story based on their own personal drives and desires rather than just because they were told to by someone else. Marissa arrives inside the mansion and wanders about until she finds a bedroom containing some torn apart toys and a coffin laying on the bed. This is actually a really great example of visual storytelling. In fact, Monpuku does more to set up Flanders Scarlet in this episode. Than they do for almost any other character in the series. If you're wondering why I said it like that, go watch my last video. The tension and drama leading up to her introduction feels great. We get so much of information about her character just from expressions, body language, and environment, and even from Marissa's reactions. Marissa so far has seemed pretty fearless, and she easily keeps her cool around characters who are far more powerful than herself. When she meets Flander, however, all of her composure goes out the window, and she's very unnerved by the small girl's disposition. It's a powerful way to show the audience how unusual Flander is. Flander fires off a volley of magic before exclaiming that she's been very lonely for a long time, and she's very excited to have someone to play with. It kind of bugs me a bit to see people thrash the way that Flander was written in this series because many do not like the violent and unhinged interpretations of Flander. But even if you don't care for that interpretation, I find it a bit ridiculous to pass her off as bad writing when she's actually one of the most well rounded and complex characters in the entire series, as we'll see throughout this episode. Anyways, Marissa gets all fired up, and before they start to fight, we cut to the true villain of the episode, Romilia Scarlet. Romilia gives a short monologue before setting off the Scarlet Mist, which covers Gensokyo. We don't really get much else in the way of introduction, we don't really know who this character is or why she's turning the world into a Doom 16 map. But luckily for us, we don't have to understand, because one of the characters is just gonna tell us why. We cut back to Marissa and Flander fighting, and the fight is abruptly stopped by Patchouli capturing Flander inside of a water spell. We know that the water damages Flander because, not 10 seconds later, the show's most annoying character appears to explain to the audience what is going on. I'm not even exaggerating. Kawakuma is the worst character in the entire series. I want to beat her to death with a baseball bat every time I see her on screen. Now, a more engaging and less direct way to explain this weakness that Flan has would be to show her accidentally backing into the water and sizzling a bit of her wings off. This isn't the only way, but it's faster, it saves on animation, and it rewards the audience for thinking critically about what they're seeing instead of just being spoon-fed the action by a lore monkey. Anyway, Patchouli launches into a speech telling Flander to stay put while Romilia and the others get to work conquering in Sokyo. Then she tells Marissa that humans will become servants because of their short lifespans and inferior magic. Hmm... I just... I feel like I've heard this one before. The fight begins and we get that cool anime whiteout effect, and the episode ends with a cliffhanger. While this cliffhanger does build tension very well, a good cliffhanger isn't all about setting up stakes. A bad cliffhanger leaves the viewer wondering why tension was built up in the first place. Imagine for a moment you're on a roller coaster. The roller coaster stops at the top of a hill to build up tension, but then instead of a rapid drop, it slowly rolls back to the starting position and ends. It would be a worse feeling than if you had never gotten on the roller coaster to begin with. So let's see how well Memories of Phantasm delivers upon the stakes that are set up at the end of this episode. Oh, whoops, I forgot to skip the first three minutes of the episode, my bad. Now we can get back to the... Wait, what? What is this? Okay, there's another scene, but we have to unpack this later, so we're gonna keep going on so we can get back to the Marissa on Patchy action. So we get back to... There's another fucking scene?! Okay, I'm just going to skip all the rest of this for now. Don't worry, we will come back to it. So finally, seven minutes in the episode, we can finally watch the scene that left us on a cliffhanger 
19 months ago. That's it? They made a cliffhanger for that? It isn't bad to pace an episode in a non-linear fashion like this, and in fact, I think it works very well in this series. But if that was the way that this episode was written, then why did they even make a cliffhanger at the end of the second episode? The stakes were never real and there was no payoff. Why even leave the episode off like this when they could have written a more satisfying intermission? This is going to be a problem that we see throughout the series, and it's only going to get worse from here. So let's take a step back to look at some of the scenes I skipped over. Not this one, like I said, we'll get to that later. This is where we introduce the B-plot of the episode. Here, Raymu sees the red mist and realizes that an incident is happening. This, of course, would be detrimental to the value of the Shrine Maiden coin, so she decides to go check it out. She flies past Rumia, who is yet another cameo that is just here for fan service. In fact, Rumia isn't really worth mentioning in this scene since she's on screen for less time than it has taken me to say these two sentences. We get to Mei Ling, the front guard of the mansion. Now up to this point, we've been setting up Mei Ling as a pretty formidable enemy. The first time Aya gets dropped in front of her, it's implied that she gets her ass served to her on a silver platter. All of the dialogue about mailing has been out of fear, so it seems like we're setting up for a pretty awesome fight here. Even though from a pacing perspective, we're still in the middle of the patchily fight. The music picks up and both opponents strike fighting poses. Let's go, I'm ready for some hand-to-hand -hand brawling. Oh, come on. Now, like I've mentioned, there isn't a problem with skipping over fight scenes like this. In fact, it's pretty much a necessity in such an expensive indie project like Memories of Phantasm. But the problem lies in setting expectations for the viewer. If you're gonna take time to set up a character in the beginning of an episode, then you should deliver upon that setup. It would have been better if we didn't see Mei Ling at all before this scene so that it could have been played for comedy. Imagine if this was the first time we saw Mei Ling, and she immediately started striking ridiculous poses and monologuing about her proud and mighty family line, before Raymu just interrupts with, you talk too much, before promptly blowing your face off. It would have been hilarious, and it wouldn't have made Mei Ling's setup in the first part of the episode feel so pointless. This is going to be a lot more obvious in the next scene as we see a fight that is much more intense but actually has considerably less setup. I am, of course, talking about... Now, calling this part the best worst fight scene sure makes for a good chapter name, but it doesn't really give the whole picture from the name alone, so allow me to explain. The fight scene between Sakia and Reimu in the scene is both terribly poorly planned and incredibly well executed. The things it does right are amazing, and they're some of the best things that this series will ever do. But at the same time, the things that it does wrong are terrible, and they stick out so obviously that they almost ruin the good parts. I think that we have to start out with the positive things, because they contextualize the reasons why the bad things are bad. First of all, I love the shot composition throughout. There are so many incredible angles that play with perspective to give you an idea of how powerful Sakuya is. You can see from the beginning of the fight that she has the literal and metaphorical high ground. There's also some great use of bright red light to highlight points of focus. Knives are used to add additional background detail without making the shots look too busy. The posing's impressive, especially this pose where Sakia's body is an analog for the hands of a clock. The use of Sakia's time stop mechanics is both well placed and satisfying. And let's talk about the character herself a little bit. This scene has some fantastic potential for storytelling from the characters involved. In this show, Sakia has a disgust for humans despite being one herself. She explains that this is because humans do not understand her power and loathe her for it. The only other person in the world which understands her is her mistress, Romelia Scarlet. And now she's fighting against another human who she is much stronger than to save her lady. It's compelling and character-driven, and it really sets up expectations for an emotional and energetic fight. The problem is that this scene sets up so many expectations and then delivers on none of them. To reiterate, the shot composition and dialogue both tell us that Sakya is considerably more powerful than Reimu here. The audience is left to wonder how the protagonist could ever succeed against such an opponent. Will she use clever deception? Will she attempt to exploit Sakia's personality flaws as she did with Yuyuko? Well, no. She just... wins. Completely inexplicably, she wins. Sakia covers her in a hail of blades and Reimu's body just disappears. We've never seen this technique, we don't know what it is, and we couldn't have possibly expected it. Sakia falls into some sort of ceiling trap and Reimu blasts her out of the house with a yin-yang orb. It is so horribly contrived. Reimu doesn't win because her opponent fails in some way. She just wins because she's the protagonist. The reason that the story gives for why Reimu succeeded is that everyone in Gensokyo is actually really strong, so Saki is not that strong by comparison. It feels undeserved, because if instead of writing a clever solution to an obviously strong opponent, 
The story just tells you that Sakia is strong and then pulls a Lamau, she's not actually that strong. I bet we really fooled you with that one, huh? The story paints itself into a corner and then just acts like the corner was never there to begin with. Imagine if during one of these dialogue scenes, we saw Reimu holding seals behind her back and sneakily planting them on the ground wherever she stood. This would paint Reimu as using superior wit and charisma to defeat a physically more powerful opponent. We also know that Reimu seals can create physical barriers. This is also an ability taken from the games. So when Reimu is attacked with a final flurry of knives, we could show her activating the seals to form a massive barrier to stop them. Don't use this fake out ability. It's a really cool idea, but the audience doesn't understand what it is or even know that it exists at all until now. And it's never used again in the series. It's a contrived deus ex machina, and it feels like a letdown. Reimu is set up from the very beginning to be a very smart character to contrast Marissa's reckless power. So let her do smart things. This scene is still very good. I'd even say that it's one of the best. But it illustrates an important point, and that is that Memories of Phantasm so often has great ideas and sets them up very well, but it seems incapable of delivering upon those ideas in a way that makes sense. It is for this reason that so many feel that the writing in Memories of Phantasm so often undermines the best aspects of the series. Now, let's get back to the primary plot of this arc, the Scarlet Devils. Flander walks into Romilia's throne room and then confronts her. Right off the bat, great looking scene. Romilia pulls the whole humans are weak shtick, and even Marissa points out in character that this is an overused plot beat. Small side note really quick, having your characters point out that the story's writing is repetitive and weak doesn't play it up for laughs. It just makes it painfully obvious to the audience who already knows that your story is bad. Anyways, Flander charges up towards Romilia and they both fight. This fight scene is perfect. I genuinely would not change a single thing about it. It's full of emotion and passion. You can feel the raw power between them as they fight both hand to hand and with powerful magic. The music and animation keep the energy flowing even when the sisters aren't the primary focus of the shot. Their dialogue and expressions tell so much about their history and relationship. The amount of anger in Flanner's face combined with her desperate and ravenous attacks contrasts with Romilia's calm and focused magic. The fight ends with Romilia disarming Flander and charging forward, but instead of a killing blow, she brings in Flander for a gentle embrace. What we get next is a really touching and surprisingly cathartic dialogue between the two devils. We see that Flander wasn't imprisoned here because of her power, she was actually imprisoned because of her weakness. Romilia knows that the Hakurei Shrine Maiden is powerful to kill both of them, so she had to wait until she was able to bring the Red Mist against Sokyo to let her sister out of the basement again. But this entire plot doesn't really make any sense considering that they just got to against Sokyo and Flander has been trapped in the basement since long before then. So this revelation just kind of comes out of nowhere, and while it could have been a really touching and emotional scene, it ends up being more confusing than anything else. It's really painful to watch the plot blend with Romilia's character like this, since she's paired next to Flander, who is such a more realistic and fleshed out character. And this is a major issue throughout the series. Memories of Phantasm has a lot of really good standalone scenes, but they don't flow together well into a single cohesive narrative. And that statement alone sums up the majority of complaints I've had about the series so far. The Chen chase scene is great, but it doesn't fit the overarching plot. The Mei Ling fight could have been really funny, but it was set up as if it was going to be something completely different, and then rug pulled for no reason. Using Aya as a recurring plot device is a great idea, but she is constantly showing up in plots that she has no reason to be in to make up for the fact that the writers just forgot how to characterize any of the main characters. There are of course exceptions, as I've stated that I think that Flanders is a really well set up and executed character, and I think she's actually one of the best characters in the entire series, but more often than not, it ends up setting up things that it never delivers upon, or just wholesale copying concepts from other anime, with no regard for how that anime actually uses those concepts. A good example of this is how Suwako fights using a giant stone fist in the 17th episode. It's a neat concept for Suwako, considering that she can control Earth as a native god. But the fist doesn't really make sense as a shape. But hey, it's a pretty cool Full Metal Alchemist reference, right? The difference is that Edward Elric is designed as a hot-tempered and sometimes violent kid, so using alchemy to create giant stone fists not only fits his range of abilities, but it also suits his personality and design. If someone like Edward Elric were real, they would probably use giant stone fists. But the way that they set up Suwako in the events leading up to this scene is as a sneaky and secret backdoor goddess. She hides in the back of the shrine and the other characters call her an ace in the sleeve. So wouldn't it be way cooler for her to summon a giant stone snake to fight with instead of a fist? It could be pretty much animated identically to the stone fist, but it would have its own identity separate from the inspiration material. It would match her characterization as being sneaky and deceptively powerful, and it would be a great reference to the source material and source mythology to boot. In just about every way imaginable, animating a giant stone snake here would have been a better choice. 
but instead the writers decided to copy and paste a concept from Full Metal Alchemist without taking a moment to think about how they could fit it into Memories of Phantasm. It's sad to see, because there are so many points at which you can see the creativity of the creators thrive. But those few moments are suffocated by a majority of scenes that feel out of place and don't make any sense. It's the reason that so many viewers of Memories of Phantasm say that it has bad writing. It's not as though the writers don't know how to produce a good story, but they clearly struggled in tying it all together with the ideas they had during production. I guess in a lot of ways it plays out like a series of concept animations stitched together in haste, rather than a complete anime series. So past this point, I don't really need to go episode by episode, as the things that the series does right and wrong are by and large the exact same things that it's done so far in the first four episodes. To summarize quickly, every villain that follows the first episode uses the exact same story structure. Bad things happen, the protagonists go to check it out, they run into a boss that looks like it'll be a tough fight but is actually a steamroll because of some deus ex machina. They fight the boss's fiercely loyal stone-faced second-in-command, and the fight is really good but it gets blown over for really no reason. The final boss is some egoist who monologues about how weak humans are before putting up a big fight, and then getting nuked because they overlook something incredibly obvious. There's nothing wrong with this structure, but there are many things wrong with using it nearly every single time with no twist. Now, an astute viewer may have realized that I left out a few episodes which don't follow this format, and that is intentional. It is because a few times that this series breaks out of this mold to try something new, the results are fascinating, and I have to talk about them individually. Since this show so rarely steps out of its comfort zone, the few times that it does, it shows us how much we are missing throughout the rest of the series. But what are we missing in the first place? What does this show have that puts the rest of the series to shame? So let's talk about Cheerno. The seventh episode of Memories of Phantasm, titled Mysterious Giant Yokai, is a filler episode that is so well produced that the rest of the series feels like a letdown by comparison. It acts as a window into the world of the creator's capabilities. I'm not even exaggerating that when I say, from a writing perspective, this one-off filler episode completely blows every other episode of Memories of Phantasm out of the water. The plot's driven by the characters, the characters act in ways that are consistent with their design, the scenes flow together into a single cohesive narrative, and most importantly, the episode is compelling. The scene gets the viewer invested in the current events, sets up stakes and thrills, and then delivers upon them in a satisfying way. While the first episode is in many ways the best episode on a technicality, I actually think that episode 7 is much more enjoyable to watch. So let's dig in a bit and actually talk about why this episode is so much better, and see if we can find the missing link that would have improved the rest of the story. The episode opens with a quick shot of the character Chirno, seeing an enormous silhouette of a yokai in the distance. Roll the intro and we're at Alice's house. A little fairy who we haven't fully met is here. This is Dayusei. This timid young fairy asks Alice if she has seen Chirno before flashing back to a scene of the two fairies getting into a petty argument. Chirno is bragging as she always has throughout the series, but her worrisome and compassionate friend Dayuse pleads with her to stop before she gets hurt. Chirno is, of course, not abated by her friend's cries, and their argument causes Dayuse to begin crying and fly off with a devastating declaration. I'm not your best friend anymore! This sentence could instantly destroy a second grader. Chirno hurls back some playground insults and we're back to the present day. Dayuse is confessing to Alice that she feels sorry for what she did, and she's still very concerned for her friend. Alice is clearly uninterested, but for one reason or another, she decides to help out the sad little girl. This entire opening scene is shockingly well executed. The characters demonstrate their personalities through their actions instead of exposition. They express complex ranges of emotions, and more importantly, they feel real. I cannot express how surprised I was when I felt emotionally moved by this frame of Dayuse. Getting into arguments with friends is something we've all had to experience before, so it's easy to sympathize with what Dayuse is feeling right now. She's still a bit bothered by Chirno's behavior, but that frustration is so far outweighed by her concern for Chirno that she's willing to approach complete strangers for help if it means giving her a chance at finding her friends safe again. I said that before that Flander is one of the most well-written characters in the series, but she's not the best. Because the most realistic, sympathetic, well-rounded, and well-designed characters in the entire story of Memories of Phantasm are these two silly little fairies. The following scene shows Chirno asking around for the Daidarabochi, and getting some pretty wild answers of what it is from the main protagonists. This scene isn't anything mind-blowing, but it does serve to develop the mystery of the story and show us a little bit more about who Chirno is as a wonderstruck kid. Again, it isn't groundbreaking material, but it is very good. We get back to Dayuse and Alice, who are walking through a big market festival. Alice explains a bit of what's going on, and we also get to see it for ourselves through some good b-roll. It is a bit expository, but it's brief enough that it doesn't start to feel dragged on. Even throughout the scene, we get to see a bit more of who Alice and Dayuse are, and we get to see a bit of foreshadowing that perhaps Alice knows a bit more than what she's letting on. Dayuse sees Chirno fly overhead, and she chases after her. Cut to Chirno flying down a big metal hole. 
She runs into Utsuo Reuji, the fearsome sun god that we've heard so much about. I think that the bait and switch here actually is more well written than the bait and switch used for Mei Ling. While Mei Ling was set up as being fierce and menacing and then disappointingly steamrolled, Utsuo was set up as being extremely powerful, and in truth, she is exactly that. But the reason why she isn't quite as scary as she seemed originally is because the audience never stopped to consider that she might be dumb as shit. This works because it doesn't feel as though the show lied to us. We imagined our own ideas of what a big scary sun god would look like even though the series never specified that she was ever actually that dangerous. So when the bait is pulled, we realize that the writing was actually always consistent, and that it's actually really fun and clever. I'm in love with meathead villains who could be so much more if their brains weren't filled with concrete at the age of 7. Utsuo is one of the first major villains in the series to not follow the typical conceited and sadistic template that was established by Yuyuko. She has unique goals, a unique personality, and a killer design to boot. It nails her canon design while also bringing its own unique flair. Simply put, Utsuo is one of the best villains in the series. She subverts expectations in a sensible and hilarious way, she breaks out of the established villain template to bring new life to the series, and she's the perfect antagonist for Chirino. I'll explain that part in a bit, but let's keep watching. The two talk and a fight scene begins. The fight scene is considerably less intense in choreography, but significantly more intense in emotional impact than most of the other fight scenes we've seen so far. I can't point to any other scene in the series that made me go, oh shit, the way that I did during this explosion. We know as the audience that Chirino is not as strong as she thinks she is, so when we see her get a reality check here, the possibility of her getting seriously hurt is very real and very concerning. So when she lands so softly in the arms of her best friend Dayusei, there's this immediate wave of calmness that washes over the viewer. Chirino finally realizes that she's not strong enough to take on this fight on her own, and she takes a hit to her own pride by accepting Dayusei's help. It's the perfect emotional climax, because the plot of the episode was never about finding and defeating the giant yokai. It was about Chirino and Dayusei learning to overcome their personality flaws to be better friends with each other. So for this plot, there could be no better resolution. They combine their powers and... Chirino still messes up the perfect freeze. Hey, the plot was about them overcoming their flaws, not overcoming their stupidity, after all. A quick scolding from Malice and Suwako is enough to put Usuo back to shame and end the battle. In any other episode, this ending would have felt like a cheap cop-out because in every other episode, the goal of the episode is as simple as fight the bad guy until the bad guy stops. This isn't a bad plot motivation, and in fact it's pretty standard for the shonen genre, but if you're going to make the plot of every episode about fighting the bad guy until they stop, you can't resolve the conflict in any way that doesn't resolve fighting. If you do, it feels cheap and undeserved. Limiting your options in this way will make your stories feel repetitive, and punish you as the writer for trying to make new avenues of resolution. Since the seventh episode of Memories of Phantasm brought a new type of story to the mix with new focal characters and motivations, it had the freedom to resolve the conflict without fighting, which breathes new life in the series that had already begun to stagnate. The episode wraps up with Chirno and Daiyusei getting to see the giant Kappa advertisement balloon, which is named as the true source of the Daido Robochi. The mystery is uncovered, and we get to see the surprisingly touching scene of Chirno apologizing to Daiyusei. It reveals an entire new side to her character that we've never seen before. For her to step down from her proud behavior to apologize, means that her friendship with Dayusei is more important to her than feeling that she's the strongest around. We see the two make up, and the episode ends on a very sweet note, as well as the final minor twist that Alice's giant doll was behind it all. The final end scene is entertaining, because it follows up on the bits of foreshadowing we saw throughout the episode without undermining the conflict resolution. This was the most engaging and enjoyable episode of the series for me, and it's a damn shame that we're never going to see anything else like it again. The rest of the episodes in the series aren't all that worth mentioning. Episodes 5 and 6 are the 60 Years incident arc. It's a two-part filler episode that could have been a one-part filler episode. Nothing that happens here is relevant to the overall plot of the series, it's just cute antics with some characters that people love. There is a bit of setup here for characters that will be important to the next major arc, but none of this setup is really developed upon, so it isn't all that necessary. It isn't the worst thing, but it's very boring. It's telling that the only online discussion I've seen about this arc is about how short Aki is, how annoying Aki is, how fat those Komachichis are, or the Donald Duck sound effects. And no, that isn't part of the fandom, that's in the actual mechs. Design is my passion. 
But yeah, this arc is a lot of nothing, which is why I mentioned earlier that the Imperishable Knight arc is actually the second major arc. There just isn't that much plot here to talk about. It's cute, but the story is just not there. Aki isn't even really an antagonist, she just kind of shows up and chews everyone out. It feels like the kind of filler in a shonen anime that people would put on a list of episodes to skip, except it's part of an indie project that sells individual DVDs for every single episode. Episodes 8 through 13 are also pretty good, but they're just reskins of the plot of the first episode but drawn out over several more episodes like we've discussed. Being formulaic isn't always a bad thing, but it limits the potential of the story writers to create something subversive and exciting. Alternatively, breaking out of the template can also be a bad thing, such as with the 60 Years Incident arc, which was significantly less interesting than the rest of the series. And I think this illustrates the reason why so many shows stick to a formula when it works. Breaking the formula is a serious risk. If it goes well, the end result is amazing, but when it goes wrong, it ends up being noticeably bad. So I can't fully blame the Memories of Phantasm team for being formulaic, especially considering the enormous risk associated with every single episode's release. The few times this series does break out of its safe haven and create something fresh and new, well, it just makes me think about what else it could have done right but never tried to do. So that's Memories of Phantasm, right? A bunch of loosely connected animations that all follow a similar formula and rarely go outside of it. No, no, this can't be it. I feel as though there's something we're missing. Some through-running thread that ties all of this together. Something so vital to the series that could either make it or break it. Something like... A true villain. So since episode 2, and in pretty much every episode ever since, we've gotten glimpses of this mysterious figure, Yukari Yakumo. She speaks in riddles, she teases Reimu, and she has an overall unsettling exterior. Now this is something that is fascinating for the series. You see a lot of episodic adventure stories follow a pretty loose anthology format. The protagonists meet a bunch of different threats as they go that aren't necessarily connected, but they get small bits of development along the way. Meanwhile, as the plot is chugging along, it starts to build toward a final end boss, some great and powerful evil that connects the rest of the series together, and resolves the plot of the entire season, sometimes the entire series. And the way that Yukari is written in this scene in episode 2, it absolutely looks like it's going to go in that direction. This is fantastic! It ties the series together, it adds more complex motivation to the plot, and it gives some amazing opportunities for storytelling. But unfortunately, as we've seen before, the memories of Phantasm writers seem unable to commit to many of the opportunities that they have. Let me say that off the bat, having Yukari fill this role is amazing. Since they didn't get to use her in the plot of the game she debuted in, they decided to completely rewrite her character to be relevant throughout the series. Using Yukari as an omniscient, omnipresent villain is also a perfect match for her ability to create gaps. So it really was a perfect fit. And this is the kind of rewriting that I would have liked to see for other characters. It changes the character enough that they can be used for a completely new kind of story without having to redesign any of their core aspects. The problem is that the writers don't do much with this new redesigned Yukari. For most of the series, she just exists to explain the lore in a way that is tantalizing enough that some of the audience might forget that exposition is a boring way to world build. See? I told you we'd come back to this scene. Now, imagine for a second if all of these characters were fully clothed and sitting in a lounge. I cannot imagine for a second that anyone would have cared about what was going on here if it was not for the fanservice. As I've stated before, fanservice isn't a bad thing by nature. But when it's used to cover for bad writing, it ends up being a shaky facade that most viewers will see through. And I think it contributes to the common complaint that the fanservice in Memories of Phantasm is pointless. The truth is that the fanservice itself isn't pointless, but it is used as a band-aid to cover up scenes which are themselves pointless. Bad art can be saved by a good story, but a bad story can't be saved by good art. So anyways, back to Yukari herself. She's a really interesting character in Memories of Phantasm. She's this kind of shadowy and mysterious villain that occasionally appears to talk to the protagonist or chat with her inferiors. Something that we do get from this bath scene is that Yukari is incredibly intelligent. Her and Ron both have an incredible understanding of the world that they live in and what is going on around them. Later we see that this is because Yukari can use her gaps to spy on pretty much anyone in Gensokyo. Throughout the series we get the idea that she's pulling the strings of the incidents. And in the final arc we actually see that this is true. The primary antagonist of the Moria Shrine is, of course, the same boring villain archetype we've seen these three times already but the plot twist is that she's being manipulated by Yukari to fight against Reimu. The dialogue here also implies that many of the other incidents so far have been a proxy for Yukari to enact her grand plan. The pieces are all coming together. We've gotten tidbits of this incredibly powerful and intelligent supervillain for the last 10 years. It's clear that she's got some sort of Xanatos gambit going on behind the scenes. And when we finally get to see her grand motivation, it's... to kill Reimu? Well, 
What? No, this doesn't make any sense at all. First of all, the reasoning behind this motivation doesn't work. Yukari says that Reimu has been killing too many yokai and upsetting the balance of Gensokyo. But throughout the entire series, Reimu hasn't killed a single yokai! In fact, she's painted as a character who rarely does her job, when she doesn't have personal reasons to get involved in the incident. So why would this preserve the balance of anything? If anything, it allows the strongest yokai like Romilia to go completely unchecked and potentially wreck all of Gensokyo. But it gets even worse. Not only is this a dumb motivation, her master plan doesn't even work. And you are never going to believe the reasoning behind the failure of her plan. She didn't think about Marissa. I'm not joking, this is the actual reason that the Moria Shrine conspiracy fails. Oh no, how could we have possibly calculated for this? How could we, too superly, how could we, two superhumanly intelligent yokai with magical scrying capabilities, have possibly thought that Marissa, the character who has involved herself with the plot of every single incident in Gensokyo's history, would possibly get involved in a plan to destroy her best friend? Impossible! This couldn't be! You see what I mean? This could have been an amazing plot thread. Yukari could have been one of the best characters in the series, and I'm not exaggerating when I say she could have saved the story. But writing a smart villain is really hard. And when it goes wrong, it's painful to watch. And that's exactly what Yukari is. Painful. It's painful to see a villain who's supposed to be the smartest character make such an obvious blunder. It's painful to see low-tier erotica be implemented in the absence of an interesting story. It's painful to see how much Yukari could have been, but never was. But even with all of that, I still think we're missing something. Memories of Phantasm had such a strong start, but throughout the series, each episode becomes worse than the previous. The stories repeat themselves, the animation quality takes a nosedive, and the length of episodes gets progressively shorter, forcing each arc to be stretched out over several episodes. But the question remains, why? Well, so far I've been reviewing this series purely from the standpoint of its artistic merit. That is to say, everything I've talked about is what this series did well as an art piece. But this is the modern era, and there's another angle to consider. Something that ties together a lot of the questions that have been left hanging so far. To really understand Memories of Phantasm, we have to talk about money. Here comes the money! Here we go! Money talks! Here comes the money! Memories of Phantasm is a piece of art, but it is also a product. In order to continue production, Monpuku needs to continuously fund musicians, animators, and cleanup artists. So in the attempt to cover for the cost of production, they sell DVDs of each episode at conventions like Rei Taisai, alongside merch designed by Luna Moon. If Monpuku receives more capital through merchandising than they lose producing an episode, they produce a profit. Otherwise, they make a loss. It's basic economics, so I'm sure I don't have to break it down that far. So one might ask, how much does Memories of Phantasm make in profit? The answer is nothing. In its 12 years of production, Memories of Phantasm has never once shown a profit. It is, and has always remained, in the red. But why is this? Well, a few reasons, really. Anime is very expensive. This cost analysis published by Japanimate breaks down the production cost of a single season of anime in 2010, which was estimated to be 11 million yen, which was about 145,000 US dollars at the time of publishing. Oh wait, did I say one season of anime? I meant episode. It would be ridiculous to expect that kind of money to be put down up front by a small circle of lead producers. So the budget of Memories of Phantasm had to stay extremely tight if the leads ever hoped to make back their investment or increase their production quality. Voice acting was one thing that was left out to save on budget, much to the chagrin of many viewers. Several of the leads also took multiple roles in the show's production, such as Luna Moon being both a character designer and an animator. While this trimmed down costs, it also led to the lead's creative resources being stretched thin across many roles, and a subsequent drop in quality. So the series suffered on its minuscule budget, and while it was able to complete the production of its first few episodes, it never made back the initial investment. And since the show remained in the red throughout its lifetime, there was never an opportunity for Monpuku to get back up on its feet. This is why we see the animation quality decline as the series continues. In the first episode, ignoring the leads, the credits list 29 animators, 18 cleanup artists, 18 colorists, and 10 other artists filling various different roles. Compare this to the most recent episode, which only credits 18 animators, 4 other artists, and 3 outside studios that have been contracted for cleanup and coloring. That's right! The revenue from Memories of Phantasm is so bad that they have resorted to outsourcing animation to China, and they still cannot manage to turn a profit. Another angle to consider is that Memories of Phantasm is not easily marketable. You see, there's a sort of paradox when it comes to making marketable anime. Investing in an anime's production is a massive risk. 
So oftentimes the investors will force the production studios to make less original content in favor of making safe and marketable content to guarantee a return on investment. Unfortunately, when every investing company follows this train of thought, the market is flooded with bland and unremarkable anime that turn away viewers and make the marketable anime actually less marketable. And this is one of the major problems that Memories of Phantasm faces. Unlike most modern anime, Memories of Phantasm was not contracted by a major investor. Instead, the lead creators put their own capital on the line to fund its production, in hopes that merchandise revenue would fund the show's continued production. This had some benefits and detriments. The major benefit is that the lead creators could create whatever show they wanted to produce, within the boundaries of Zune's derivative work guidelines. They didn't have investors breathing down their necks to tell them to make Yu Yuko's tits squishier. Instead, they had Tommy for that. Unfortunately, the major detriment of being self-funded is that all the financial risk associated with Memories of Phantasm production rested solely upon the shoulders of the lead producers. So while Monpuku had the opportunity to create something incredibly original and innovative, it seems that they ended up sacrificing the quality of the writing and animation in order to remain marketable and reduce financial risk. The end result is that Memories of Phantasm tries to be many different kinds of show at the same time, to appeal to all kinds of audiences. But in the end, it accomplishes very few of its goals well and ends up becoming even more difficult to market. Some parts of the show try to be an action-packed Magical Girl series, some parts of it try to lean into the slice-of-life aspects, some parts dip into adult content, and the juxtaposition of these three genres is awkward and poorly executed. Oftentimes, viewers of the series end up saying that they like one of those three aspects but are annoyed by the others. Viewers who picked up the series for the action often find the drama boring, and viewers that are invested in the drama often find it too brief and shallow to be worth watching. The inclusion of sexual fan service also adds to this divisive nature. Fans who weren't expecting sexual content might get whiplash from seeing Chen's ass, and fans who were expecting a lot of sexual content might get whiplash from not seeing the ass of any of the other main characters. Monpuku tries to cater to both crowds, but due to poor execution and a lack of clear direction, it failed to satisfy either. I've mentioned before that the inclusion of sexual fan service is hardly a bad thing from an artistic perspective, but from a marketing perspective, the sexual fan service in Memories of Phantasm is fairly divisive, which is harmful towards revenue. I think that if the show had committed more boldly either to the presence or lack of sexual content, it would have found better success with its target demographic. Now, I don't want to labor upon this point, but another controversial choice that Monpuku made in the marketing department is the use of their creative platform to vocalize political opinions. Tommy often uses the official Monpuku Jinja Twitter account to discuss his views on current political events, mainly those concerning political correctness and freedom of speech in Japan. This has resulted in some confusion amongst viewers of the series, who followed Monpuku without expecting to see these kinds of tweets. Unfortunately, when confronted by these kinds of fans, Tommy defends his use of the platform for political discussion. Often such confrontations become hostile in tone, and Tommy has in the past mentioned the possibility of muting or blocking Twitter users who disagree with him voicing his opinions. Some Twitter users have asked Tommy to move his political opinions to a separate personal account, but Tommy responds by calling these requests censorship. It seems that Tommy's opinion is that, since Monpuku is a Dojin circle, they should be more upfront about the creator's political opinions because they aren't a corporation that needs to maintain good public relations. Now, regardless of your opinions on Tommy's personal beliefs or his use of the Monpuku Twitter account, it's undeniable that politics are divisive. We've discussed before that Memories of Phantasm is already being marketed to a very small potential audience. Can Monpuku really afford to alienate any of that audience through controversial politics? I don't think so. It's clear that some fans do not mind the political opinions, but they would prefer that they are kept on the creator's own personal channels. Our world is going through a lot of hardships right now. A lot of people are looking for an escape from the exhausting cycle of doom and gloom that the news cycle puts them through. And for many people, Toho and Toho Fanworks are that kind of escape. It's a fantasy world where cute girls get to lounge around and have fun all day long. In fact, fantasy escapism is one of the reasons why Zoom created Toho to begin with. I'm not saying that Toho isn't at all political. It is rather quite political at times. But when you associate your brand with open political views, you will inevitably turn away some fans. And in a fan work like Memories of Phantasm, your fans are your lifeblood. It is fully within Tommy's right to use the Monpuku account in this way, with the permission of the other circle leads but it is undeniably a dangerous business decision. One other point I want to go over that has undoubtedly limited the reach of Memories of Phantasm is the lack of revenue options outside of Japan. While Japan is, without a question, the largest audience for Toho Fanworks, there is a small audience outside of Japan that loves Memories of Phantasm. But for international fans, there are almost no options for supporting the series financially. The DVDs are expensive to import overseas and don't contain English subtitles, since it's a derivative work, Monpuku does not have the option to license to streaming service for royalties, like many other anime do. The only option for Memories of Phantasm viewers to watch the series officially in English 
is through Monpuku's monetized YouTube channel. This channel only uploads episodes in low quality in order to encourage DVD sales, while also bringing in a very minor stream of ad revenue. Unfortunately, this has the opposite effect of driving most viewers to third-party websites where they can watch the series in high definition with fan-made voice acting. It's hard to say how much of a negative impact piracy has had on the anime industry as a whole, but it is clear that the biggest impact it has is on the sales of anime DVDs. For Monpuku, DVDs are one of their only sources of revenue, so the effect that piracy has upon Memories of Phantasm is significantly higher than the effect that it has upon other shows. In truth, I don't think that Memories of Phantasm could have ever been profitable long term. It adheres to the conventions of a dying medium, while refusing to innovate and embrace its own identity. But I do think that maybe it could have done much better in the financial department, with some crucial changes in management. So here we are, an hour and change into the script and I still haven't explained the title of the video. Well, the truth is, it means a lot of things. The creators of Memories of Phantasm, in a lot of ways, failed to understand their own work. They didn't commit to the genre of the series, they didn't understand the characters that they wrote for it, and they didn't know how to market it in a profitable way. But the creators aren't the only ones who misunderstood Memories of Phantasm. Let's talk about the critics of Memories of Phantasm. Memories of Phantasm is a confusingly controversial show in the English-speaking Toho fandom. While it has a massive number of fans, most of the discussion surrounding it is decisively negative. In this Reddit post, a user asked for the community's general opinion on the series. The poll votes are overwhelmingly positive, but running a sentiment analysis of the comments section returns mostly negative results. Reading through discussions on Twitter yields similar results. But instead of reviewing the series and looking at what it wanted to be and how well it accomplished that, so much of the discussion ends up just being a complaint fest. And as I mentioned before, the subject of most of these complaints, such as lore deviations and fan service, are in poor taste and don't serve to improve the series or benefit any reader. A big point that comes up very often in discussion is the comparison of Memories of Phantasm to the two other major fan anime, Summer Day's Dream and Hifu Activity Record. But for several reasons, I don't think that these anime can be compared so flippantly. Summer Day's Dream barely reached a third of the runtime of Memories of Phantasm, and while Hifu Activity Record is often considered to be more technically impressive than Memories of Phantasm, it also struggled with poor direction in the story writing that even led to abuse and lawsuits among members of the circle. Not to mention that the Hifu Activity Record had financial backing from a Chinese millionaire who was personally invested in the Toho project. Memories of Phantasm is often criticized as being inferior to the other two mentioned series, but considering the absolute scale of it, I don't think that it's a fair comparison. Memories of Phantasm outlived Hifu Activity Record and Summer Day's Dream by a considerable margin. And even in the face of incredible financial hardship and intense criticism, Memories of Phantasm has continued. Even as I am writing this script, Memories of Phantasm is still in production. So I don't think that these shows can be compared one to one. But I think the mere fact that so many viewers tend to lean more towards the other two shows brings up a point that can be compared between the two of them. And that's the commitment to genre. Summer Day's Dream is a lighthearted and cutesy slice of life anime which is something that Memories of Phantasm tries to be at times. But Summer Day's Dream commits fully to the genre and aesthetic, meaning that those that love the genre will likely enjoy Summer Day's Dream more than they will enjoy Memories of Phantasm. Likewise, Hifu Activity Record attempts to be a more serious drama with elements of mystery and action. While it also has some of the identity issues that Memories of Phantasm has, it does manage to commit to the genre more strongly than the latter, which is more pleasing to the fans of that genre. So it's clear that there's a desire among fans to criticize Memories of Phantasm, but there aren't many strong criticisms of the series itself. So many viewers have strong opinions of Memories of Phantasm, and yet, I have not seen a critical analysis of the series that does more than just cinema sins the fuck out of it. And I think this is where we see the failure of the self-proclaimed critics of Memories of Phantasm. A lot of people watched the series and did not like it, but they did not understand exactly why they didn't like it. So instead of taking the effort to dive below the surface and discover the authorial intention and various problems that the series faced during production, they took it at face value and vented their complaints about it. But in this race to air our frustrations with memories of Phantasm, I fear that we as a community have forgotten why we wanted to criticize it to begin with. If our goal is to inspire better works, then complaining about its flaws without presenting alternatives will do no good. It will only breed further negativity towards other creators. It's a negative feedback loop of complaining that is detrimental to the Toho community. So I hope that it's been clear throughout this entire review that my goal is not to complain about Memories of Phantasm. It is instead to inspire the community to make great works of art and to think more positively about the media that they consume. So is that it then? Memories of Phantasm was doomed from the start by bad management and a refusal to innovate. Is the only takeaway from all of this that a Toho anime could never happen? Well, no, I don't think so. 
and I still don't think it's entirely doomed now. It will never show a profit, that's for certain. But even in all of its mistakes and hardships, Memories of Phantasm has become one of the most influential Toho fan works ever made. Fan anime may never be profitable for the Toho project, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't make it. Make the fan work that you want to make, but also be realistic, and be wary of those that would take advantage of your creative passion. If Memories of Phantasm could make the end product work, I'm sure that you can too. I hope that it's clear that my goal in writing isn't to tear Memories of Phantasm apart. My goal is also not to tell you how to create your own fan anime. I can't tell you that, I don't know. My goal is instead to bring a fair and critical eye to Memories of Phantasm, a show that is so often misunderstood. The creators misunderstood it because they tried to make it so many different things that they forgot what it was to begin with. The critics misunderstood it because they focused far too much on what they wanted it to be that they didn't examine what it wanted to be. The fans of the show also misunderstood it because they blindly praised it for the experience that they had while watching, and never bothered to dig deeper below the surface into the serious issues that it and many series like it have. Nobody really knows what Memories of Phantasm is, and maybe, even after all of this, I don't really know either. But at times, we can see glimpses of what it wanted to be, and every once in a while, I think it ends up being exactly that. In July of this past year, Klaus Oldenbury passed away at the age of 93. He lived to see a shuttlecock transformed from an object of hatred into a cultural icon of its people. I don't know if we'll ever be able to say the same about Memories of Phantasm. I don't know if public perceptions on it will ever change. But if there's one thing that I hope this video did for you, it's that it gave you a new perspective on the show, to be able to see the good in it, and really to see the good in other art pieces as well. But more importantly than anything else, I hope that you will look towards your own art pieces with newfound hope and determination. Thank you for watching.